there that are usually not on the user interface call. So that's good. Um, maybe we can recruit some of you to join. There's a poster in the back that describes how to sign up for the working groups. And you can also get that information from our um, foundation website. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit real briefly about the working group and what we've done over the past years, and then hand it off um, uh, Anna Palma, Nick, uh, Mark, me, Primder is uh, um, uh, really responsible for the main things we're going to see today. I know you can't see it on Zoom, but um, can, can you just stand up for, just raise your hand back there so everyone can see you? Yay. Okay, and then Nick's over here and you'll, you'll hear a lot from him. All right. Um, we formed the user interface working group a few years ago and we came up with three goals. The first one was to understand the UI differences between various versions of I2B2 and Transmart. Um, when the foundation first came together, um, I2B2 and Transmart communities had previously sort of split off a bit and we even had some groups in there. So we weren't even familiar with what each other were doing at that point. So it was first kind of just getting together and figuring out what are the different features and UI elements and different programs. Goal number two was to learn how similar programs have addressed our UI challenges. So there's ITB to Transmart, but there are other tools around that do similar kinds of things and what can we learn from them. And then finally, goal number three is identify and maybe help coordinate ongoing efforts to improve and extend these UIs. Um, so for goal number one, uh, we had a bunch of different guest speakers over the first year of the working group. Um, I presented on the I2B2 web client. Um, before there was a web client, there was an I2B2 workbench desktop application that we took a look at. Um, there's new user interfaces for temporal queries. At that time that we shared, we looked into Transmart user interfaces, Shrine. Um, two other programs, Glowing Bear and Leaf, which um, are not built by this foundation, but are other um, groups have developed um, new user interfaces sort of inspired by ITB2 and trying to address limitations that they saw. Um, and we looked at demo, demos of ITB2 actually installed. Most sites don't just use ITB2 or Transmart out of the box. You do something with it to incorporate it into the workflow of your institution. Even if it's just a logo, but you know, at Beth Israel, there's a lot of customizations to get it um, connected to the systems there. Um, for example, we looked at ITB2. I2B2, just real quick, is very rich in features, but it can be complicated for um, new investigators to be able to jump on and understand how to use it. Or there'll be features in here, date constraints or other stuff that they're not even aware of unless you um, sit down and show it to them. Um, picture is kind of on the opposite spectrum. Picture was, um, uh, was part of the foundation here for a while. They try to do a really, really simplistic Google-like interface so it's easy for people to jump on here and use it and um, get started on it, but it doesn't have the same kinds of functionality that something like I2B2 does. But you know, it's important to consider um, how you would approach an interface for a, a brand new user to these kind of tools versus what an advanced user might be looking for in a full um, web client. Um, Glowing Bear, I mentioned, was um, a separate group that was trying to improve on what um, existed in I2B2 and Transmart. Um, you know, Anna Palma, we'll talk about in a bit, was started looking into a new interface for Shrine and ACT, and Glowing Bear inspired a lot of um, that and what you're going to see today. Rather than the horizontal way of building up queries, they're using a vertical way here, which um, allows a lot more space to see the concepts, and it's a more natural way, I think, for a lot of, um, uh, a lot of users. They also had some really nice ways in Glowing Bear of searching for um, concepts. Um, at the time, in an earlier version of ITB2, searching for terms in ontology had a very had a messy UI that's been cleaned up and uh, also that part of that was inspired by Glowing Bear. Um, we've heard about LEAF a couple times already today and I think we'll see more of them in the future. Um, LEAF started out um, as uh, kind of ITB2 users and they switched over to OMOP and built um, a, a user interface that was and inspired by ITB2, it has that horizontal um, uh, build to it, but they have a really nice redesign of it. Um, they make things um, 
uh, a key thing to what they do is they make, when you drag things in, English readable. So rather than just dropping in here as I see code one, two, three, it says, I'm looking for patients who have a diagnosis of something or other so that the investigator can just kind of look at the screen and read it out loud and they understand what was, uh, what they're being queried, what's being queried. And we really like that and that was incorporated into the Shrine UI and we want to do more and more of that instead of I2D2, these kinds of translating what, you know, an informatics person looks at a bunch of codes and Boolean combinations, but an investigator wants a description of what, uh, what the software is exporting. And then down here, they had some nice um, breakdown and uh, other um, plugins that um, have been useful in thinking about our designs. We looked at Transmart. Uh, Transmart doesn't have all the query capabilities of I2B2, but it has a bunch of analysis capabilities where you can compare cohorts and do different kinds of statistical analyses, bring in genomic and clinical trial data. So it's another um, thing that we can take a look at on how uh, user interfaces are developed for those types of analyses and data. So goal two is taking deep dives into UI elements. So after we looked across all these different products, we picked out specific things and said, can we um, really look into these things in depth in a different products and come up with a, a best combination of everything? So the first thing we looked at was ontology, um, browsing and searching the ontology. Uh, we liked leaf user interface for that. We set up some public demos for it so we can all look and explore it. Um, the leaf user interface uh, um, has really been incorporated into the latest versions of I2B2 and the Shrine Act UI. Uh, we talked about uh, ontology in general, about how the structure impacts usability, um, how you organize your ontology, how you name the top level concepts. It all, it, 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 it affects a lot on whether or not it's easy for users to navigate those ontologies or if they're going to have trouble finding what they need to get to. We've taken some deep dives into Query Builder, particularly about building queries horizontally like ITV2 and LEAF are doing it vertically like Glowing Bear or Picture. Um, modifiers, we started looking into this and we all agree that it's really complicated and let's kind of come back to this after we've uh, done a great job with ontologies. And same kind of thing with temporal queries. Temporal queries is difficult. Just conceptually, it's hard to wrap your head around if you're doing a temporal query of multiple different events and the relationships between them. It's hard to even thinking about it. And then it's even harder to express that in a user interface um, and investigators get that right. Um, so ontology, for example, on the left over here, this is what the search results used to look like in I2B2 when you would um, uh, uh, run a search term. And then on the right in 1.7.12, it was more organized. So with, it shows you within a hierarchy that looks like an ontology where the terms that you search fit. So it's grouping them in a more logical way and it's showing you the parent paths back up so you get the context of what, what the things are. So here um, there's a, a major depressive disorder and there's two different areas within the diagnoses hierarchy where that peers. And that just makes it a lot easier for users to understand what they're getting, if they should go up to a higher level in the ontology. This is, this is actually an older version. There's a lot more that's been added to it. You'll see what's, um, uh, where this has culminated in the new user interface on that nickel demo. Modifiers, I meant, are challenging. ITB2, you can do a lot with modifiers but really only experts of the user interface know how to build up complicated queries like this. Um, LEAF has a much nicer way of doing modifiers, but it's very simple. You can only do, I think, one modifier. It has to be all predetermined in the, um, in the database. So you can't, you can't build up complex um, modifier combinations like this. So, you know, you, this was built in I2B2 to try to be as generalizable as possible, but we need to co come back later in this working group and figure out are there um, sort of templates or simpler approaches that can get at the most common modifiers. And then finally, goal three, and this is what we've really been focused on in the last couple of years in this working group, is uh, first with the Shrine and Act User Interface, working with them very closely, reviewing wireframes and providing suggestions on how to um, create that new user, now new user interface. It rolled out, people really loved it, and they kept asking, when are we gonna have this inside of the main ITB2 web clients? 
Um, it took a little while, but we got some funding to do that, and that launched this new project. Um, so Anna Palmer will talk, I think, where is she? Oh, uh, there, okay. <laughs> so Anna Palmer will show, I think, a little bit about how the Shrine interface um, inspired and transitioned into the new I2B2 web client. And then uh, Nick will um, uh, just recap what the new web client looks like and then go into some technical details because there's been some other efforts in the past to update the I2B2 web client. And these always started with building a brand new web client. And the problem with it is that people have been using the current one for many years, have built extensions and plugins. Um, investigators are used to the, uh, 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 you know, the interface. So a brand new tool, you would have to someone throw out your existing infrastructure and move to it. So all attempts in the past kind of never worked out, either because it was missing functionality or didn't have the support for plugins. So that was really critical here. Nick um, is a key person who built the original I2B2 web client and the, the mechanisms for how it handled plugins and called the I2B2 APIs. So trying to keep as much as the existing a, uh, web client intact and just modifying the graphical layer at the top, that would be ideal. And I, you know, that's, uh, so far people have liked it. You'll see some details of how the plugins work. And the hope is that this is what's gonna be able to finally replace the um, old look and feel of the uh, I2B2 web client with um, ideally a release sometime in the spring. It's gonna be important for this I2B2 user interface working group to continue to provide feedback and, see, and give them our suggestions as they build this. And then what they're doing in this initial release for the spring is really just trying to replicate what exists today in I2B2. But once we have the new framework, it'll be much easier to go in and tweak how modifiers are done, temporal queries, and getting um, your suggestions and um, uh, helping off the designs of this feature wish list and uh, figuring out what elements from I2B2 and uh, LEAF and other interfaces we want to combine would be very helpful on that. So I think that was, oh, okay, one last thing. Um, these were, this is from the very first, uh, um, um, I2B2 annual meeting right after we launched the user interface working group. Um, some of the items that uh, people wanted to eventually um, tackle as part of this group. Um, some of them that were done I've removed from this list, but things that are still um, in progress, and I don't think we're done yet, are uh, related to building queries, some modifiers, temporal queries. Another is family relations. This is something that comes up a lot, particularly in genomic studies. And um, it's a complicated to th thing to work your head around. There's one thing about building a query for one person, but if you're looking at these are the characteristics I want for the mother and this is the one I want for the child, it gets more and more complicated. Um, Nick Brown made a, uh, a nice prototype um, um, a few months ago, but I think we should look at that at some point. And then querying for specimens and other data types. ITB is all about patients, but Transmart allows other kinds of things. So is there a point where we want to look at how do you query for other stuff. For data quality and data insights, um, I2B2 now has a term info tab where it gives you a little bit of information about an, each ontology item, but you can think of much more you want to put in here. Data quality information, counts by year. Um, we talked about in our ontology working groups about uh, information about ex, um, uh, retired codes and changes and meanings of codes over time. So really being able to explain this and uh, user interfaces to, to share this information to investigators would be helpful. Federated data quality metrics. Um, Jeff Klein for the ACT Network developed some prototypes for this and I think there's gonna be much more of this in the new ACT um, network that you'll hear about uh, afterwards. And then health services and healthcare utilization. Um, in stuff like loyalty cohorts and computational phenotypes, um, healthcare utilization is really important. Things like fact counts, the number of data a patient has, or healthcare utilization, and how many visits they've had per spirit, uh, period of time. Um, these are important in these algorithms, and it might be important to be able to visualize these or um, allow users to query these through the user interfaces. And there's general functionality. Um, ITB2 Shrine and Transmart are all implementing single sign-on capabilities, and what would it look like to flip back and forth between I2B2, Shrine, and Transmart? Um, Michelle warned me today, uh, yesterday, that um, 
people can get very confused if we make it too similar between ITB2 and Shrine and Transmart. If you're running a local query or a distributed query, it might be good to have some graphical elements to make it really clear um, that here you're doing one, a, a, a local ITB2 versus a federated query. Um, there's kind of things like that we need to look at in terms of single sign-on, not just uh, you can do it, but what is the UI implications if users are bouncing between these different programs and they may not understand the differences between them. And then localization, uh, we're a global community and how do we uh, um, modify the user interface for different languages. And how much of this is a UI piece? Uh, you'd have to, uh, there have to be in the ontology as well if you want to have different languages for those. You know, there's, there's certain things that you can do purely in the UI, but a lot of it also has to be syn synchronized with the ontology as well as the back end codes to make sure that the APIs can um, uh, perform the functionality you need for the user interface elements. All right, so with that, I am really done now. And um, uh, Anna Palmer, are you going to do an intro or are we switching directly to Nick? Okay. All right, so. Um, let me just get my screen up and ready for everyone. Are there any questions, sorry, before you jump in, are there any general questions about the user interface working group or suggestions for uh, meetings for the next year, yeah? So they'll, they'll talk about a lot more. What we're, the aim for is that early next year to have a new user interface that has all the functionality that the current web client has. It may not be beautiful and might still be messy from modifiers or things like that, but uh, so that investigators at least have a way of reconstructing the kind of queries they can do today. Um, I think of this sort of phase one, you know, there's going to be more phases where we go back and see, okay, now in the new user interface, can we improve the way that temporal queries are done and can we figure out cleaner um, ways that investigators can do the modifiers. But I, I think it's supposed to support all the types of complex temporal queries that you can do today, um, but maybe not solving some of the problems people have today with understanding how you link together events and construct complicated queries. Yeah, I, I think, so the, the question is, someone built a complex previous, complex query, including temporal queries or other kind of things, can that previous query be dragged into the new UI's query tool and be reconstructed there? Um, I think that's the goal. You know, there's, there's still work to be done to get to that point, but um, I think our objective is, if we're gonna be providing a new user interface for it to be able to support what um, sites have been giving investigators in the past. There, 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 no, no, there, right, there, there's a release right now of I2V2 that has the SAML, but there's no changes to the to the design of that. Then there's going to be another release of I2B2 next year that has the brand new um, kind of refreshed user interface that will, um, uh, yeah. Right, there was a release of I2B2 just a couple months ago or so that has a lot of this, great. Right. Right, right. There, there's a there's a there's a release of the Shrine interface that um, has temporal um, capabilities in there that different from um, 
uh, the stuff that's in, uh, different from the new ITBT user interface. Yes. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Perfect. Okay. Have you guys put any work on error handling and friendlier user messages instead of like the JavaScript F12 PM cells down for all errors? <laughs> yes, yes. So the question, yes, yeah, so you heard the question was um, uh, more investigator friendly um, error messages. Um, so as I mentioned before, some of these things are things you can do in the user interface and some of it is also would have to be paired with changes on the back end. So that's, um, that is a good request, but I think it's, it's something that's um, involving more than just the user interface. It's also working with the back end developers to figure out can we create friendlier messages that then can be bubbled up and displayed in the UI. So that's, a, that's a good point. I'll add, I have that slide that had the, like the wish list, the things that the working group is working on. I'll add in um, better error handling as uh, one of the general features. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone, or perhaps late morning. Uh, so I'm going to be discussing kind of what the new plugin architecture looks like, how to create new plugins. Uh, we are going ahead and uh, encouraging people to use the new plugin design uh, to create additional functionalities. If you have old plugins, they will still work in the new user interface that's gonna be released uh, next spring, uh, but we will, encourage you not to do that because there's just so much more capability you're going to have in the new uh, framework. So before you jump into plugins, um, can you just like the user plugin. interface. Okay. So we can do if we're going to do user interface. Uh, sorry, I didn't uh, I thought uh, we had a lot of people there uh, here today that saw the presentation yesterday. Just as a reminder. Yeah, so stuff. user interface, uh, this is the new design uh, in use. We've got our uh, terms that uh, is the onco uh, ontology terms. You have the ability to dig into things there. You have the ability to actually find terms uh, such as asthma. You can go ahead and select that. Uh, it brings up search results after a slow network uh, connection, perhaps. Uh, you have the ability to select your categories, do that. Uh, it's using the new uh, design uh, that I2B2, uh, the currently released uh, version, uh, is presenting the search results in. You have your workspace for saving information uh, that perhaps you're going to be sharing with the rest of your research group uh, or just uh, items that you uh, are using for your personal research. You have your previous queries down here that you have the ability to dig into, kind of see the different types of results, whether it's just individual uh, patient counts or whether it is going to be a larger uh, set of information such as breakdowns. Uh, you have the ability to go ahead and uh, run a search by dragging over, let's say, asthma. Uh, you can pull asthma over and run, uh, get a, a patient set, and you can break down your uh, various attributes of the patient set that comes back. And after processing for a couple of seconds, gives you uh, the numbers, uh, lets you break down all that information, and then also gives you a nice graphical representation of the data set that you have retrieved. Uh, once you have all this done and you have your patient set and your data that you want to do analysis, you can go to analysis tools. And this is going to be a list of uh, modern plugins as well as your legacy plugins. The, the only modern plugin currently running right now is just this sample plugin. It gives you raw access to 
uh, a whole bunch of the functionality that uh, this new plugin design um, incorporates and uh, ingests from the main I2B2 window, uh, the main I2B2 client uh, window, and then you have uh, your legacy ones, which are quite literally the legacy code. You don't have to make any changes in order for the legacy plugins to operate. Uh, there are some nuances. Uh, there's some annoyances if you're uh, running it, uh, such as maximizing, minimizing windows kinds of kind of resets your uh, plugin and you have to do some operations over again, perhaps, but uh, otherwise you are running uh, those plugins. Uh, so jumping back, uh, first of all, any questions? Yes? Uh, this is the new user interface. So this is not released yet. This is what we've got done in the past several months, paths, I don't know, six months, I'm guessing the exact date, but uh, let's jump into uh, kind of the slideshow on. Are there, are there other questions about, yeah. I think you're gonna get really deep into the technical things in the slide, but just general things about this user interface. So um, this, yeah, so um, kind of a, probably a, the sort of preview version of this will be released, I think, near the end of this year. But then it'll be the plan is for this to replace the existing web client and um, a future ITB2 release um, probably around next spring. Um, so this this isn't available um, yet. Uh, so what we're doing here today is showing you where it is and what it looks like. And in particular, we know a lot of institutions have built plugins and they're concerned about. Um, how their plugins will be supported in this framework. And um, they're interested in knowing about if you're gonna build new plugins um, that are better optimized for this thing, what is that gonna look like? So this is what Nick is gonna show is um, uh, kind of an e early preview of that. So you're not totally shocked in the spring when there's um, a new version. Yeah. What's important, what's important to know about this new web client is not a, really a replacement for the old one. There's multiple layers. There's a layer in the software that communicates with the API. There's a middle layer that stores things in memory. It's literally the same stuck code as the current web client. So think of this as you know, each version of I2B2 that's released, there's usually some tweaks to the web client, some new features that are added. So this is more like a a much larger um, you know, redesign of that existing web client. So in the same way that you would install the new web client when a regular I2B2 at least comes out, this would be the same thing. You know, this would be what's um, packaged with I2B2 as the web client. So yeah, this would replace the old one, but it's not really a completely different program that's replacing the web client. This is more like the next um, version of um, the existing web client. Yeah, you, you could use. Yeah, you could use both of them together. Um, you know, the this in the initial release won't have some of the admin tools that the current web client does. It'll have all the you know, the investigator facing pieces and the plugin support. But um, you know, this is meant to be the you know, the next iteration of the, the web client. Yeah, you should be able to use the same older web client with ITB2, but the, the training will have to be changed a bit. I was just telling them that I got to change all my screenshots that I have in training materials at Beth Israel uh, for this, yeah. Yeah. We, I, I know that some people already have nice uh, videos and other things that they're working on, but yes.
good news is that we have, we have some hours in the uh, mail, and that is a great man here. I'm hoping that you can build one that works well outside of the supply wall. We're trying to build it out of the generic flavor, so this is a nice. I'm not making a promise. So as an important important note for our ITP2 team to come here is to remember that everybody's built training materials for their institution, and that um, the and that a challenge or a barrier to potentially rolling out this new UI is making sure that we're aware that institutions have lots of screenshots and instructions and videos that um, are the way you're going to use a new UI is different in some important ways than the old one. Yes. Together, right? Which is what we want. And, and the generic, you know, training doesn't, doesn't look like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I keep eating into his plug-in time. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the, the visual aspects are going to be different. Uh, we've changed colors, as you've seen. Uh, the major layouts are still the same. Uh, the plugins are going to be your legacy plugins will work fine. You won't have to change the training material there, so don't worry too much. But uh, the new design for the new plugin really is going to uh, be an architectural change, but it still exposes uh, the same development uh, interfaces that you're used to in your legacy. And what I mean by that is that, uh, and here's uh, actually the current code repo we have not released yet, but we do frequent pushes to the repo. Uh, we are looking for pull requests. We are an open development group where we want to get people involved, get people in the code, get feedback on the code. Um, a very fast iteration and very agile. Uh, we're running through that. Um, and it's all front end code. You can be running it uh, against the older I2B2 back end. It's fine. It should operate without problems. Uh, and we have some not so current documentation for you to help uh, understand how to do development plugins uh, if you haven't done so before. Uh, but the way that we're doing it now with the newer development uh, of the newer plugins. Uh, you're going to not have constraints like you have in the past. Uh, with legacy plugins in the past, uh, there are uh, certain technologies that were baked in to the framework that you just kind of had to use. Uh, also, I wanted to uh, talk about the repo, the documentation, and of course the team that's currently working on this heavily and uh, very thankful and we are moving quite quickly on this uh, and reskinning and uh, building new functionalities and better user interface uh, for the I2B2 project. Uh, let's talk about the old style versus the new style plugins. Uh, so one of the core objectives uh, has been uh, building a new I2B2 user interface with new technologies, uh, new libraries that support new user interface without breaking the old plugin system. Uh, and one of the other things that we also realized is that the way the old system was designed with regards to plugins, plugins were operating in the same space as the rest of the framework, as the rest of the application. So what we have decided to do in the new design is to make every plugin run inside its own iframe. What that does is that eliminates the potential for whatever you do in your plugin from interfering with the main I2B2 code base. So what ends up happening is you can use Angular, somebody else can use React, 
and those two plugins can exist side by side on the same screen and you don't need to have any interactions that are going to cause problems. You're not gonna have version issues. Uh, they're completely isolated and they're communicating using uh, the standard I2B2 uh, user interface communication method, the SDX subsystem, uh, standard data exchange subsystem that's been there since 2007, 2008 uh, with the original I2B2 web client. So that means with regards to modern plugins, sorry, but you're gonna lose access to Yahoo user interface. So if you're a fan of that, uh, that's not gonna be good for you. Prototype, if anyone actually remembers that, uh, there is jQuery, but you can load in the newest jQuery into your own plugin without any issues. D3 we removed, but you can bring it back in. We are just trying to give you a bare minimum environment to start your plugin development journey. And you add whatever you want to that. And you don't have to worry about screwing anything else up uh, in the main user interface or in other people's plugins that are gonna be running side by side with yours. Um, what you're gaining. So uh, coming out of the box, you're going to have basically a blank HTML page and you're gonna have one file. Uh, that file is gonna be the support stub loader and what that does is it will inject uh, into your uh, namespace uh, communication layer so that you can communicate with the existing I2B2 cells uh, so that whole communication layer that you've depended upon for your old plugins is still there, but it's even better because now it uses ES6 promises. So you're gonna be able to use promise programming for asynchronous um, uh, retrieval of data, and then have that use modern programming techniques in order to intercept it, rather than using the old style, which was kind of hackish back then. Uh, you're gonna have access to uh, SDX layer code. So the drag drop communication uh, technology is going to be injected into your code base uh, with a single line and uh, something new uh, with the I2B2 uh, modern plugins is you're gonna have something called state management. So uh, one of the side effects of having this new design for the user interface is if you have a window that's there that had your plugin in there that you're doing stuff and you're like, I need to move this to my second monitor and zoom in on it, blow it up, expand it. When you disconnect it and you expand it into its own pop-up window, it's going to lose state because it's going to reload your iframe. So the I2B2 state manager uh, routines that are gonna be injected automatically into your namespace for uh, your plugin that's going to work uh, to prevent you from having problems with data disappearing when you have certain user interface interactions. Uh, of course, you're gonna get, have your iframe isolation. You are the supreme commander of your plugin space. So you don't have to worry about anything. Use whatever libraries you want, uh, no worries. Uh, Having said that though, if you really insist on creating legacy style plugins, uh, even though you need to use the internet wayback machine to find documentation on Yahoo user interface, um, that's your choice. And we do have a specialized environment for legacy plugins that has the legacy I2B2 framework, the legacy uh, libraries from back then, and you have the ability to actually continue development on your legacy plugins uh, as well. And that's something that um, you're gaining it because it's no longer connected with the main I2B2 code base. It's its own standalone environment and you can go ahead, blow that up, trash that, add all types of stuff you want to that. And it's not gonna bring down the main user interface. It's not going to impact any other plugins in that's loaded into the user interface at that time. So uh, legacy style versus modern style. Uh, so running legacy plugins, uh, like I said, isolated within an iframe uh, and 
mentioned uh, duplicating uh, the I2B2 client legacy plugins. Uh, that's being done through its own IDE frame. Uh, with regards uh, to the legacy plugins, they're actually doing all the communication within that standalone IDE frame. So you are not going to have the logging capabilities if you're still using legacy plugins. Uh, the legacy plugin environment is going to handle the new design for the native HTML5 drag drop. So you'll be able to drag drop content into those legacy iframes. Uh, and then also, like I had mentioned earlier, sometimes when you have these legacy uh, plugins loaded and you do some sort of user, user interaction, such as maximizing a window, popping it out, putting on a different uh, computer screen on your on your uh, computer, uh, it will lose state and you're going to have to drag drop and rerun an analysis, but it, it'll still work. Uh, and this is kind of what it looks like on the left hand side. You're going to have uh, the main I2B2 uh, stack for the main user interface. And then uh, on the right hand side, you're going to have the legacy plugin manager. Uh, you can see that the legacy plugin manager has three layers in there uh, that are uh, both the HTML, the data model, and the communication layer are all full duplicates of the legacy I2B2 web client. Uh, so it's a snapshot with the head cut off, basically, and just your plugin running. Uh, and uh, the new style plugins. You're minimizing the number of I2B2 support libraries uh, to only three libraries uh, or four libraries, one of which you need. The other three are injected automatically uh, just by including that one main library. Um, you're not going to have any version conflicts with libraries. Uh, all the uh, communication that you do using those libraries that are injected into your own iframe when you use those communication uh, routines to communicate with the main server, the main I2B2 hive, you're going to end up going through the standard uh, backend channel, which is going to be set up with logging, analysis, uh, error reporting, et cetera. So as we build the new I2B2 client and get more and more uh, robust functionality in it, the new I2B2 plugin, a new style I2B2 plugins are going to be able to fully utilize all that technology as it comes online. Um, you can also run it, uh, some future things, you can run it in secure mode where it's uh, standalone. You can sandbox it since it is a, an iframe. You can lock it down so that it cannot do any communication uh, besides the communication through the main uh, user interface, which means that if you load a plugin, a third party plugin somehow, uh, and it tries to contact a rogue server, that's going to be rejected because you said it does not do any AJAX calls, it cannot call anything, it cannot load anything that's external. Uh, sandbox controls on iframes are very strict. Uh, they use them in banking applications for absolute security. So there's a lot of potential that we haven't even started exploring because we want a functional application before we start locking it down and treating it like Fort Knox. Uh, and there's uh, additional uh, functionality for uh, preserving the state. So when you move things around, uh, you expand, uh, you pop out the window and move it to a different browser window, you're going to have the ability to um, have the state of uh, the plugin be preserved and reloaded once it gets moved around to some other place uh, on your uh, user interface. And this is what it's going to look like. Once again, left hand side is the main I2B2 code base, the main I2B2 user, user interface. And as you see on the right hand side, uh, you're going to have your new plugin manager. There's going to be a tiny green sliver, which is just a uh, stub that allows you to link back through the system into the ITB2 communication layer. So uh, besides that, you can load whatever libraries you want, jQuery, React, Vue, Angular, et cetera. 
Uh, there is no limitation to what you can do within your, uh, within your plugins now. Um, startup uh, process change, we have the cell configuration data. It's still pretty much the same. There has been some file changes. Uh, we are going to be working on documentation once we get a little more time or a little more demand from the community uh, saying that they're eager to create plugins. If you are looking to do new plugins, reach out to us, make some noise. Uh, we'll allocate resources to try and get documentation to you guys so you can start making plugins sooner rather than later. Uh, also, some of the original function calls for your plugins, such as destructors, constructor functions, um, those can just be handled now by uh, document on load for your main HTML window. Uh, they are not going to be scripted uh, like they were in the past. So let's jump into actually making a modern plugin. Uh, directory structure, we have it much more elegant now. Uh, we do not have uh, cells and plugin names uh, and, or cells and plugin directories next to each other in the I2B2 user interface uh, structure. We have our own plugins directory off the main web client hosting directory, and you're just gonna break out your plugin, uh, kind of like they do with Java, and uh, do it by domain name. So EDU, Harvard, Catalyst, example plugin is one of them. Uh, on the screen you can also see org.i2b2.multidemographic that's another one. Uh, you also have a plugins.json file. Uh, in the current I2B2 uh, web client proxy that's written in Node.js, used for development purposes, uh, that plugins directory, is, that plugins JSON file is automatically generated from the directories of all the plugins that are installed on the machine. So uh, plugin listing. Um, that's the file I just described. You just list out in a JSON file all the different uh, plugins you have on your system, and it's going to go ahead and load those plugins and make them available to be used when your web client is loaded into the browser. Um, the plugin definition file, which actually is uh, existing within the main uh, folder for your own plugin, your own modern plugin, is almost exactly like the old style of the legacy I2B2 plugins. You can look at the uh, quite anchored uh, plugin document, uh, web developer document that's been out there since 2016, 2014, I think. Uh, more details in that document. Um, and here's where it comes down to it. This is the only thing that you need to put into a blank HTML file in order to make yourself a plugin. So blank HTML file, include this JavaScript file, and it's going to inject three different uh, support systems into your uh, global namespace within that document. And it's gonna be the I2B2 Ajax, uh, JavaScript file, I2B2 SDX, and I2B2 state. Uh, each one of those uh, corresponds to a different subsystem or a different area of functionality that they support. Uh, once those things get injected, uh, you're going to have uh, a blank HTML file, one JavaScript file included, and once that file, once all that loads, you're going to have an I2B2 variable that exists in the global scope of that uh, iframe, and it's going to give you access to Ajax, access to a model area where you save your data that you want to have persisted between page reloads. Uh, you're gonna have SDX, which is the drag drop functionality. So you will be able to use functions from i2b2.sdx dot and a couple of functions, and now those divs that you ran those functions against are valid drag, drag and drop targets for you to be able to receive drag drop operations from the main I2B2 window and or other I2B2 plugins. 
Uh, and then we also have the state uh, variable i2b2.state.save. Anything in the i2b2.model namespace is going to be saved to the main i2b2 window and it will be persisted through page loads uh, for your i2b2 modern plugin. Um, just running through the support libraries very quickly, i2b2.ajax, and then you're gonna have a list of cells there. Uh, underneath each one of those cells, you're gonna have a function that is the name of one of the functions that you can fire against the i2b2 cell backend, and you'll be able to just run that, pass it a JavaScript object, uh, the keys represent the various keys uh, that are in the message. The value goes there, and you basically just pass the message to the server, and it does promise asynchronously. So you just say um, i2b2 ajax work add child function dot then, and then a function, and it executes like any modern uh, JavaScript example does on how to do Ajax. Well, all, these are in the iframe, all these functions are in the iframe, and behind the scenes what's going on is these are actually communicating from your iframe, uh, your isolated iframe. It's sending uh, an inner window message. So it's actually sending a message from your iframe into the main window and that main window then has all the libraries for communicating all the AJAX, all the um, network protocol stuff. It then sends a message, message comes back, it then checks for errors and stuff like that, and then it sends back uh, a message into your iframe, and then the library here is going to receive that message, interpret it as an error, or interpret it as valid data, and then at that point, it's going to uh, execute the promise uh, that was returned when you first called this. So uh, there's a lot of magic, I guess, behind the scenes, but what you're seeing is very simple, very clean. Uh, all these things uh, that you're seeing are dynamically added on the fly. So if there's modifications in the main communication libraries, in the main cells of the uh, user interface, uh, that change will automatically be pushed down into every plugin that is using uh, modern support uh, uh, stubs uh, being loaded into memory. So, and this is also a great way to just figure out how to build a plugin is you go into your plugins iframe and you basically just look at the i2b2 object and look at all the functions attached to whichever cell ontology. Okay, let me see what functions are attached to the ontology object. It makes it really easy to kind of um, develop, browse, and I mean, probably the more appropriate way to say it is just like hack out a plugin. I mean, just sit there, drink some Red Bull, lots of coffee, whatever, and just make code. <laughs> it just happens. Uh, and then with state management, this is something that's new because of the way the new user interface uh, is giving you the ability to uh, move uh, and modify your layout, uh, the ability to pop out windows and have floating windows be dragged and uh, dragged over to uh, other desktop windows or other monitors on your desktop. Uh, that functionality is going to destroy the iframe that contains your plugin uh, in the process of doing those user interactions. That's something unavoidable. I've looked into it. It's actually a standard of JavaScript. So it's a JavaScript standard that you destroy the contents of an iframe and then reload it. Uh, and then we have our drag drop support capability. This works, uh, oh, I would say, exactly like it does in the examples and in the old, um, the old plugins that you used to make. You have an, uh, you attach a type, uh, so an SDX type, a data type to be dragged and dropped onto a, uh, onto a DOM object inside the HTML, and then you set a custom handler, which is a function call that when a drop operation occurs, 
it's going to fire off that function and it's going to pass it the SDX object, which contains all the information necessary. Um, because the new SDX system uses native HTML5 drag drop, what you're going to end up with is the ability to drag and drop from other applications even, other domains. Uh, you saw some of that yesterday if you saw the presentation I did with regards to dragging and dropping uh, concepts and uh, patient sets from a I2B2 uh, user interface, this new modern I2B2 user interface, and actually dragging and dropping that data into a widget within Jupyter Notebook. So uh, this drag drop functionality is going to be key in, in creating a bigger ecosystem of tools. And um, that's it for the non-technical aspect. I'm not sure if people want me to actually go into native HTML5. So that gives me, yeah, yeah. So I, I see uh, maybe a break. <laughs> Hi, uh, yeah, quick question. Mm -hmm. Have you determined or decided which browsers the new interface will support and which browsers you're not going to support? Definitely not IE6. <laughs> so uh, any modern browser that's following modern standards, uh, I would assume Edge, uh, any Mozilla, Safari, uh, the modern ones that are going to take uh, the standard examples that you're seeing on, on uh, what is it, a Stack Exchange. So if if the code snippets you're seeing that in Stack Exchange don't run on that browser, I don't think that we should go ahead and double the size of our code just to uh, make it work on things that are not really following modern standards. How would you provide a list of browsers that you can test on? Okay. Yeah, yeah. We, we, I, I know we do test on Chrome. We test on Firefox and um, uh, Edge. Yeah, we actually have people testing as we develop. So that's a good thing. Uh, another question? Yes. It's, it's actually on our list. It's uh, been sitting there in our backlog waiting for us to put it into one of our sprints. We haven't had a chance to put it into a sprint. We are kind of firing on all cylinders and uh, in, until we see demand from people saying that they are creating plugins, seeing that they are uh, pursuing modern plugins, um, it's going to be more important for us to focus on actually making one-to-one -one parity with this new web client and making it do it everything in exactly the same way as the old I2B2 client by spring. Uh, we do have, I think, these slides up somewhere. If not, I will put them up somewhere. Um, we did have one workshop previously, and I'm not sure what happened to the slides on that. I think they were up, but uh, we, we can definitely put resources out there. Uh, we just need to uh, figure out a location where, and we'll start dumping information for whoever wants it and reach out to we'll, we'll us. We'll be going over this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, absolutely. Yep. Right, thank you. Thank you.